Thank you, Pastor Gary, and thank you for, to all the elders in the church for hosting the former Catholics for Christ conference this weekend. It has truly been a joy to be with you, to experience the love of your fellowship, the praise of your worship, and also the hope of your prayers. This morning, I'd like you to open your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 1, and we want to look at verses 14 to 18. As you're doing that, I'll tell you that the Lord has gifted me as an evangelist, and if you don't know the definition of an evangelist, it's one who's called in from out of town to deliver a message that the church would normally fire their pastor for preaching. (laughs) As Gary has alluded to, this is a very controversial message, but it's a message that is of utmost importance because I believe that the Roman Catholic religion represents the most neglected mission field in the world today. 1.3 billion precious souls. We have evangelical leaders that have confused the evangelical church by signing unity accords with the Catholic religion stating that we share a common faith in the gospel, but that is the furthest thing from the truth. They preach a false and fatal gospel that leads people to hell rather than to heaven. And yes, there are those who have been born again in the Catholic church, but the Spirit of God will move them out as they are discipled in the truth of God's word. So beginning in Mark chapter 1 verse 14, We read, after Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, he came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. So in this passage, we see Jesus has just begun his earthly ministry, his preaching ministry on this earth. His first command was what? Repent and believe the gospel. His priority was evangelism. From the very beginning of his ministry, his plan was to use disciples to make disciples. He is calling disciples to follow him so that he can make them become fishers of men. Instead of casting their nets into the sea, he is now directing them to cast their nets into the depths of fallen humanity. The Lord Jesus is giving his disciples a new purpose for living, a higher calling with a much more important priority. And that was the first thing I realized when the Lord saved me. He gave me a new purpose for living, now to live for him and to share the gospel with those who are perishing. The Lord's divine calling supersedes what they have been doing in the past. Their new purpose for living now has an eternal perspective, to seek and to save the lost for the glory of God. That was the mission of the Lord, to seek and to save the lost, as we see in Luke 19.10. But right before he ascended into heaven, he passed the baton to the church. Now we are to go after those who will never seek after the true God. Notice their response in verse 20. They immediately left their nets and followed him. So let's don't miss this. Evangelism was of utmost importance to Jesus. He began and ended his ministry with the call to spread the gospel. Well, this morning, I pray that the Word of God will encourage us all to be faithful witnesses, to make the Great Commission, the Lord's last command, our first concern. Right after the Lord saved me, I was still in corporate management, and we were invited up to a director's meeting at the Salmon Capital of the World, just north of Vancouver, British Columbia. Before the meetings began one morning, we went out at five o'clock, and I remember seeing God's majestic creation for the first time through believing eyes. And I just was overwhelmed by the beauty and the majesty of his creation. We sat there in the intercoastal waterway. I saw the snow-capped mountains on one side, the beautiful mountains on the other, and the balance of nature as the seagulls came down and fed off the fish. And I remember just lifting up a praise of thanksgiving to the Lord for giving me the experience to enjoy this. 
And at the end of my prayer, I said, Lord, by the way, I'm here to catch a fish, and I know you're sovereign. Would you send one of your fish my way? (laughs) Well, within a minute after I threw out my first line, I thought Jaws 2 had jumped on the end of my line. (laughs) Immediately, this fish runs out about 500 yards, and the fishing guide is barking in my ear, keep the pole, Ben, otherwise he'll throw the hook. Well, I battled this fish for 45 minutes. And as he got closer to the boat, the fishing guide said, now be careful when he sees the side of the boat, he's going to get spooked and run again. I laughed and said, if he runs again, he wins because I'm done. (laughs) Well, the fish was as tired as I was. We scooped it up and we went back to the fishing village. And as we approached the village, the fishing guide pointed to the number 35. He said, that represents the largest salmon so far caught in the world this year. And as we placed the salmon that the Lord sent my way, it tipped the scales at 46 pounds, shattering the world record. I said, Lord, I just wanted a fish. (laughs) But you know what is said in Ephesians 3.20, God does exceedingly more than we could ever ask or imagine. I was trembling that God would answer a simple prayer like that. Well, I can tell you that was the last fish I ever caught. That was August 8th, 1988, and ever since then I've been fishing for men. And I don't know if you know the difference between fishing for men and fishing for fish, but when you fish for fish, they're alive, but then they die. And when you go fishing for men, they're dead. They're dead in their sin, but then you have the joy of seeing them come alive in Christ. And as much joy as I had catching this world record, there is no greater joy than to see those who are dead in their sin come alive in Christ. Well, I want to share with you some principles of effective fishing. Not suggesting for a moment that I'm an expert, but I want to share with you the contrast between fishing for fish and fishing for men. There are many similarities. The first, we need to know the nature of what we're trying to catch. And when we go fishing for men, we need to know that they are spiritually dead that they have been blinded by the prince of this world such they cannot see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ. The natural man cannot discern the things of God because they're spiritually appraised. It's no wonder then the apostle Peter said, well, Lord, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. We also know that we need to be properly equipped That means we need to have the Bible with us, the Word of God, either bring the Bible or have some gospel tracts with you. We need to go where lost people are. The fish don't jump out of the river or jump out of the sea to come to you. We need to go where lost people are. And so oftentimes, we will go out to the Roman Catholic religion, the churches, and we will go out on Resurrection Sunday, we'll go out on Christmas Eve, and we'll engage Roman Catholics as they go in and they come out of their church. It's so amazing that oftentimes we think we're only going to meet 15 or 20 people, but one particular Christmas Eve, a Catholic radio producer was in the audience, and he asked me why we're doing what we're doing. And I explained to him why, and he said, would you mind coming on Catholic radio on Monday and explaining to our audience throughout Dallas-Fort Worth why you're here proselytizing Roman Catholics. I said, I welcome the opportunity. And so he invited me on. He asked me questions. And at the end of the 15 minutes, he was supposed to open up the radio lines for the listeners. And because I answered every one of his questions with the power and authority of God's word during the commercial break, he said, there will be no more questions. But you know what? The word of God went forth, and it was a great opportunity to reach so many Roman Catholics throughout the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We also need to use the right lure. I'll never forget the lure that I used. It was a 52M12. But when we go fishing for men, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. We need to cast the line. That means speak the gospel. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. We need to be patient. Give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to apply the word of God to their heart, to illuminate the word of God to them. 
How many fishermen do you know that give up after 15 minutes and say the fish aren't biting today and they go home? So be patient. Stay out of sight. We must decrease and the Lord Jesus must increase. It's all about him. And then we need to reel in our catch. And you know when you're witnessing to someone, there's a, a twinkle in their eye, they're, they're excited, they're leaning forward, they're asking you questions. I'll never forget, I was invited up to a church in Wisconsin, and I found out that this woman had been praying for her Catholic husband for three years, and she found out that a former Catholic was going to come and preach over the weekend, so she drug her husband to the church. And Saturday night, I gave a message entitled, Where Will You Spend Eternity?, and at the end of the message, I walked down and she introduced me to her Catholic husband. And I said, based on what you have heard this evening, what is keeping you from trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your all-sufficient Savior right now? And he just looked at me with a blank expression. About 30 seconds later, his wife blurts out, it's your parents. You don't want to offend your parents. He said, you know what, she's right. I don't offend my parents. Well, I gave him a couple of gospel tracts, and I asked him to read these and come back the next morning, and I'd be preaching the Sunday morning service. Well, he came back. He and his wife were the first people in the church. We sat down, and he said, I couldn't sleep at all last night. I read your tracts, and I cried out to the Lord in the middle of the night to save me, and I couldn't wait for my wife to wake up and we sat on the side of the bed together, and I was weeping and telling her I was so sorry for biting her head off every time she wanted to invite me to church and for telling me about Jesus. And I said, I cried out to the Lord for salvation. We praise God that the transforming power of his word brought this dead sinner to life in Christ. And that's what it means to reel in your catch. Call people to repent and believe the gospel. Find out what is holding them back. And just as I trusted the sovereign Lord to lead a fish my way, trust the sovereign Lord. Pray for divine appointments. Ask the Lord to open the hearts of the people that you are witnessing to. As we witness to Catholics, we need to remember the two most important truths that we must share. Number one, Scripture must become their supreme authority in all matters of faith. And number two, we must show Jesus Christ is sufficient to save sinners completely and forever. Well, those are the two most important truths as you witness to Catholics. I want to share with you some principles of effective witnessing, and we'll go through each one of these in a little bit of detail. We must get the gospel right. We must declare the sufficiency of Jesus. We must use the authority of God's word. We must teach antithetically. We must pray, we must speak the truth in love, and we must sow the imperishable seed, which is the Word of God. The first principle, we must get the gospel right. Before the Lord saved me, I was a rocket scientist down at Cape Kennedy, Florida. One of the first things I learned is that when astronauts re-enter the atmosphere, they must get the angle of re-entry precisely correct. Because if they come in too heavy into the atmosphere, the rocket ship will burn up. And if they come in too light, they will skip off the atmosphere into outer space. You're probably thinking, Mike, what's this got to do with the gospel? Everything. Because we must get the gospel precisely correct. If you take anything away from the gospel, then the Bible says those who believe a compromised gospel will skip off into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you add anything to the gospel, those who believe that gospel will burn up in the eternal lake of fire. So we must get the gospel precisely correct. What is the gospel message? Well, it's about our Lord God, the eternal creator of everything. He is perfectly holy and requires perfect obedience to his law. Man has broken God's law, and the consequences for sin is death and separation from God. And man can do absolutely nothing to save himself. 
But God didn't leave us in that hopeless and helpless condition. He provided a Savior. Jesus Christ came to earth as both God and sinless man, and after living a perfect life, he died on a cross to pay sin's penalty and to reconcile us with God. He rose from the dead, and he is alive today. What is the response to the gospel message? Sinners must repent with godly sorrow for their sins and believe in Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior. That is the gospel message, beginning with God, the holiness of God, the sovereignty of God, the sinfulness of man, and his desperate need for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We must proclaim all of God's attributes. There is a movement today that speaks only of God's love and mercy and grace, but he is also a God of justice, and he will punish every sin that has ever been committed by every person that has ever lived. He is a God of holiness. In fact, his eyes are too pure to look on sin, and he abhors all wickedness. His righteousness demands perfect righteousness for entrance into heaven. We must speak of the righteousness of God, because so often when you ask people, how do you hope to get to heaven? The most common response is, I hope I'm good enough. Well, God's righteousness requires perfection. Yes, God is a God of love, and he did provide one way to be saved. His mercy is available to all who will repent and believe the gospel. And his sovereign grace is present for all those who hear the gospel. God gives them eyes to see. And they repent and believe his glorious gospel of grace. We must warn people about what awaits those who die without Christ. The punishment for sin is death. Eternal death, spiritual death, and physical death. Those are all, all the consequences of sin. So often we just skip the bad news. But the Bible has much to say about what awaits those who die without Christ. In fact, Jesus spoke more of hell than he did about heaven. The Bible describes hell as a place of punishment where the wages of sin are paid. It is the place of despair and desperation. It is called the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. It is a place of terrible torture, dreadful agony, and soul-wracking remorse. Hope never enters there. Light never shines there. Only pain and gloom and restless agony an indescribable torment. There is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth forever. There is no escape. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I believe the major reason why more Christians are not more faithful to the Great Commission is that we cannot for a moment grasp the reality of what awaits those who die without Christ. If we could just for a moment look into hell and see the weeping and gnashing of teeth and the torment, we would do everything we could to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news because it promises the complete forgiveness of sin. It promises a permanent right standing before God. By one offering, he has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified. The gospel promises power over sin to live a life victorious in Christ Jesus. The gospel provides every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, and it also promises the assurance of eternal life. Now, when I share the good news of the gospel, I want you to look at these five points because the Roman Catholic religion denies each one of these. Roman Catholics do not know the true gospel of Jesus Christ. They have only conditional life. They have no right standing before God. And they have no assurance of where they will spend eternity. I'm often looking for ways to share the glorious gospel of grace because it is the greatest news anyone could ever hear. And I don't know, many of you probably travel. One of the most irritating things that I experience is when I get on a plane and before takeoff, there is a businessman on his cell phone 
covering all the details of his transaction so loud that people 10 rows up and 10 rows back hear everything he's saying. And I was, I was getting so irritated one particular flight, and I thought to myself, you know what, I've got some business to conduct as well. So I pulled out my cell phone, and I began sharing the gospel to this fictitious person on the other end. <laughs> About five minutes into it, my wife elbows me in the side and says, you better hope your phone doesn't start ringing. <laughs> we do have great news to share. We need to shout it from the rooftop. We sang the song earlier 2 Corinthians 5.21, do you realize that is the greatest exchange in human history? My sin for his righteousness? We read, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is the gospel in one verse. The second principle, we must declare that Jesus Christ is sufficient. Because Roman Catholics will be unwilling to let go of everything they are doing, to help save themselves until you show them from Scripture that Jesus Christ is sufficient. We are set free by the truth of his word. We see that in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. Jesus said, if you will abide in my word, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free from what? Free from religious deception, free from religious bondage, free from the power of sin. Jesus is sufficient because we are born again by the very seed of his word, the imperishable seed, as we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. We are purified by his blood, as we see in 1 John 1, 7. We are forgiven by his substitutionary atonement, Isaiah 53. Please keep this in mind. Roman Catholics do not know about the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Oh, they've been taught that Jesus died for the sins of the world. That's history. But when I found out that Jesus died for me, that was salvation. Make sure you share the substitutionary atonement of Christ. We are justified by his imputed righteousness. We are saved by his grace and mercy. Not by righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy, as we read in Titus 3.5. We are reconciled to God through his death, as we see in 2 Corinthians 5.18, and we are eternally secure by the promises of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He promises that he will lose not one that the Father gives him. So when Jesus cried out in victory, it is finished, he had accomplished everything necessary to save sinners completely and forever. He died once for all sin for all time. There are no more offerings for sin. Roman Catholics continue to go to the Mass every Sunday so that a Eucharistic Christ, a false Christ, can be offered on an altar as a sin offering for all the sins they committed in the previous week. They do not know that Jesus died once for all sin for all time and there are no more offerings so the question arises, then, why would anyone refuse to believe? When you see the contrast between believers and unbelievers, every believer is alive in Christ. Unbelievers remain spiritually dead. Believers are under God's grace. Unbelievers are under God's wrath. In fact, everybody in this world is either under God's grace or under his wrath. And once you are under God's grace, there is no going back. Believers are destined for heaven. Unbelievers are destined for hell. Believers are forgiven and justified. Unbelievers are guilty and condemned. Believers are empowered by the Spirit. Unbelievers are controlled by the flesh. Believers are children of God. Unbelievers are enemies of God. Believers are set free by Christ. Unbelievers are in bondage to sin. What a contrast. So often I wish I could share this with everyone I'm witnessing to. Why would you want to remain an unbeliever when you can enjoy every spiritual blessing in Christ? But we know there's supernatural blindness. 
The prince of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers such that they cannot see the light of the gospel. If you back up one chapter to 2 Corinthians 3.18, you see that that veil of blindness that covers every man's heart remains until they turn to Christ. So as long as a Roman Catholic is listening to their priest or their pope, the veil of blindness remains. We must exhort them and encourage them. Turn to Christ and his word. Then you will see the truth. Believers are reconciled to God and unbelievers remain separated from God. The third biblical perspective on evangelism, we must use the supreme authority of God's word. If you have your Bibles, you can look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 and you can see that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. We can use it as an offensive and defensive weapon. We can use it to slay the lies of the devil. Every lie under the sun can be exposed by the truth of God's word. The word of God pierces, it penetrates and cuts to the depths of the soul, and it never returns void. And that simply means when you proclaim the word of God, it brings salvation to those who repent and believe it, but it brings further condemnation for those who reject it. It always accomplishes its purpose. The word of God judges before anyone can be saved, their sin must first be judged by the word of God. Roman Catholics have a safety net called venial sins. They don't don't believe what the word of God teaches about sin. They believe there are lesser sins that don't cause eternal death, only temporal punishment in hell. In fact, that's the first lie of the devil when he told Eve that you surely shall not die if you break God's command. That's Roman Catholicism, the venial sin. We must show Roman Catholics that every sin is punishable by death. When you look at Roman Catholic authority, they use the word of God as one of their three authorities, but they also have their tradition. And above their tradition and scripture sits the magisterium of the church, which is made up of all the bishops. Now they say that all three of these authorities are equal, but in actual practice, it is the magisterium of the church that sits above the other two authorities and the bishops of the church twist and distort scripture so that it conforms to their tradition that has evolved over the last 1600 years. What did Peter say about those who twist and distort scripture? It is to their own destruction. Have you ever considered the internal testimony of Scripture? We can remind Roman Catholics the characteristics of God's Word and then show them how their tradition does not come close to how the Word of God describes itself. The Word of God is perfect, it is true and inerrant, it is infallible eternal, forever settled in heaven, and has authority over both men and tradition. It saves us, it frees us, it guides us, reproves us, it trains and corrects, it converts, it sanctifies, and it equips us for every good work. Scripture brings conviction, it gives wisdom, it produces faith, it refutes error, and can be used as a sword to slay all the lies of the devil. This is the word of God. This is the description of what we can share with those who are trapped in religion so that they will turn from their tradition and believe only the word of God. The fourth principle for effective witnessing, we must teach antithetically. The apostles called people to forsake all that oppose the gospel. I think a classic example of what we mean by teaching antithetically is what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Listen to the antithetical teaching. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, so that no man may boast. Titus 3, 5, he saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. All the way through the scripture, we see the Apostle's writing antithetical statements. 
the fifth principle for effective witnessing, we must pray. In Romans chapter 10, verse 1, we see Paul praying for the salvation of the Israelites. They were zealous for God, but their zeal was not based on knowledge, and so they sought to obtain their own righteousness rather than receiving the righteousness that comes from trusting in Christ. Oh, as I read those verses in seminary, I believe this was the catalyst for the Lord showing me the need to reach out to Roman Catholics because I know so many Catholics who have a similar zeal for God, but it's not based on biblical knowledge. It's based on their religious tradition, and they also do not know the righteousness God's righteousness requires, perfection. We need to pray for words to be given to fearlessly make known the gospel. That was Paul's prayer in Ephesians 6.19. We need to pray for God to open doors and hearts for us to proclaim Christ clearly, Colossians 4.2 and 4. And we need to pray for wisdom to make the most of every opportunity, Colossians 4, verses 5 to 6. I was preaching at a church in Munster, Texas, a town that's dominated by Roman Catholicism, about 85% of the town is Roman Catholic. There was one lighthouse in town, a Baptist church, and I equipped the saints all Saturday afternoon to reach out to the friends and neighbors in the city. The next morning, as I was preparing to deliver the Sunday morning message, my wife and I were in a restaurant having breakfast. And there was about 50 people in the restaurant, and I did the math, and I figured about 45 people were Roman Catholic. As we started to walk out of the restaurant, something came over me. I turned around and stopped and picked up a spoon and started banging a glass. The restaurant became quiet. And I said, I've come all the way from Dallas to show all of you how you can have your sins completely forgiven and be reconciled to God. And I'm going to be giving that message across the street at the Baptist Church. All of you are welcome to come. We walked out of that restaurant, and my wife looked at me. She said, okay, you can do that in Munster, but if you ever do it in Dallas, I will kill you. <laughs> we need to make the most of every opportunity, always looking for ways to speak the truth and love. If we truly love people, we will tell them how they can escape the lake of fire. We must tell them they have broken God's law, they are condemned by God's justice. They deserve God's wrath. They need God's mercy, and their only hope is God's Son. Do we love people enough to share that with them? When you meet somebody, whether it be a neighbor or a coworker, do you wonder, are they lost or saved? Are they headed to heaven or hell? We need to have compassion for those that do not know the Lord. And we need to recognize there is a sense of urgency. God doesn't promise anyone tomorrow. What do we mean when we say we need to speak the truth in love? Well, God does not put robes of righteousness on sinners until they are first stripped of their own. I can't tell you how many times when I've been witnessing to a Roman Catholic, they will say, I was born a Catholic and I'm going to die a Catholic. How do you respond to that? Well, the scripture has the answer taken to Philippians 3. If anybody had reason to boast in his religion, it was the Apostle Paul. You can read his resume there, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law righteous. But in the end, what did Paul say? I consider all of this rubbish for knowing Christ Jesus as my Savior. Paul exchanged his religion for a relationship with Christ. We need to tell Roman Catholics, religion cannot save you. You must do what Paul did, exchange it for a relationship with Christ. God does not make sinners alive in Christ until they know they are dead in their sins, and they need to know that all sins are mortal. I shared with you what Rome teaches on venial sins. Their doctrine of venial sin repeats Satan's first lie, you surely shall not die. What is the nature of deception? Satan deceives the world with fatal errors, often hidden beneath a veneer of truth. And I believe that's why many evangelical leaders are 
convinced that Roman Catholicism is a valid expression of Christianity because Roman Catholicism teaches the fundamentals of the faith, that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, that he was born of a virgin and lived a sinless life, that he died on Calvary's cross, was raised three days later, and will come back to judge the living and the dead. That is the common truth that we share with Roman Catholicism. But that is but a thin veneer of truth that hides a false and fatal gospel. And that's how Satan deceives the world, mixing truth with error. We need to use the truth of God's word to slay the lies of the devil. The nature of deception is simply this. People do not know they are deceived until they are confronted with the truth. Think about it. I'm sure all of us have been deceived at one point in life. When did you know you were deceived? When someone lovingly confronted you with the truth. And that is the mission of ambassadors for Christ, sharing the truth of God's word. And the seventh principle, we must sow the imperishable seed of God's word. People are born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. The words of Peter in 1 Peter 1.23, and as we scatter the seed of God's living word, he promises to bring forth life when it falls on fertile soil. So we really believe in literature evangelism. We, we carry gospel tracts with us wherever we go, whether it's at a restaurant and we engage the server, we've always got an opportunity to share scripture with them. One of our most popular tracts is the greatest news anybody would ever hear because it speaks of the greatest gift they could receive. The uniqueness about this track is it contains all Scripture. There is none of man's word, and it's divided into six categories. God's perfection, man's problem that he is a sinner, God's provision, a savior, man's part is to repent and believe, God's promise is eternal life, and man's privilege is to serve the king as his ambassador. Sow the seed of God's word. Always be ready to leave the gospel behind throughout the day. We also need to discipline ourselves to be spiritual doctors. It was the Lord Jesus who said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Matthew 9, 12. So we need to give people their true diagnosis. When they were conceived, they inherited a fatal disease called sin. When they were born, they were born sinners, and there is only one cure for that fatal disease. But we need to tell people there's more bad news, and there's no human cure for your sin. But praise God, there is a divine cure, and it's available free for the asking because of a love story written in blood on a wooden cross 2,000 years ago. We need to be spiritual doctors. Let people know of this fatal disease called sin. A hundred percent of the people who inherit it die unless they take the divine cure. Think for a moment, if you discovered the cure for cancer, would you keep it to yourself or would you shout it from the rooftops? Sin is a more fatal disease than cancer. We have the truth. We've been entrusted with the cure. We need to share it with those who are dying. Many people are reluctant to witness because of a fear of failure. You need to replace your fear of men with a healthy fear of God to motivate you. What did Paul say? Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9.16 Keep in mind that when you share the gospel with completeness and clarity, you have been successful. There's a picture of a mailman here. Is he responsible for people answering the mail? He's been successful. He's completed his job when he's delivered the mail to everybody on his route. And that's our call as ambassadors for Christ. Deliver the mail. Deliver the gospel with completeness and clarity, and you have been successful. Remember, our responsibility is to take it from the pages of Scripture to the man's ear. God's responsible for taking it from their ear to their heart. You need to show people you care for them by asking questions. 
We need to have balanced conversations when we witness to people. Unbelievers do not want to be preached at. The most effective way you can share the gospel is to ask questions. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And you can show them you care by asking questions. What is the most important decision you face in this life? Very open-ended question. Ask them what is the greatest gift you've ever received. When we go out to Catholic churches on Christmas Eve, this is the question we ask them because that is the season of receiving and giving gifts. Not one Catholic has ever said the greatest gift is eternal life. Oh, they'll speak of their jewelry, their cell phone, their iPad, their children. Simply say there is a greater gift than that. Where will you spend eternity? You know the most common response? Well, I hope it's heaven. Do you know that you can be sure right here and now? Take them to 1 John 5.13, where John writes to those who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know right here and now that you have in your possession the eternal everlasting life of the Savior. Ask them, why do you need purgatory since the blood of Christ purifies you from all sin? Take them to 1 John 1.7. Why would you need purgatory? Ask them, why did Jesus have to die? It's amazing how many evangelicals and Catholics do not know the answer. They mostly respond, he loved us. Well, that was his motivation. Why did he have to die? He had to die to satisfy divine justice because every sin that's ever been committed must be punished by God. We need to share with Roman Catholics that you can make Christ your substitutionary, believe in his substitutionary atonement, believe he died in your place and took the wrath that you deserve. Or you can say, no thanks, Jesus, I'll trust my religion. But in the end, you will meet the Lord Jesus at the great white throne. And there, divine justice will be satisfied when you hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you and they're cast into the eternal lake of fire. Every sin must be punished. Divine justice must be satisfied. Ask people, are you ready to meet your creator? Ask Catholics, why do priests continue on an altar what Jesus finished on the cross? Take them to John 19.30. Why is the sacrifice of the mass continuing? Why are priests continuing to offer the sacrifice of the Mass. Well, in closing, let's exhort the ignorant. They need to know that Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, and why he is the only hope of salvation. Show them that he is the only name given among men by which we are to be saved. We need to exhort the religious. They need to exchange their religion for a relationship with God. We need to exhort the blind they need to turn to Jesus so the veil of blindness can be removed. And we need to exhort the procrastinators. They need to know that God doesn't promise anyone tomorrow. Well, there are many ways that people respond to the gospel. And unfortunately, we have many false converts, not only in Roman Catholic churches, but also in Protestant churches. And that's because of the ineffective responses to the gospel. People are told if they simply repeat a prayer that they'll be saved. Nowhere in the Bible do we see anyone being saved by repeating a prayer. The closest thing we see is the publican crying out to the Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. But no one led him in a prayer. He was convicted of his sin. So many people believe that they can get to heaven by accepting Jesus. You won't find that in Scripture either. We are to believe on his name. We are to trust him, to have faith in him. Some people believe they're saved by signing a commitment card or joining a local church through water baptism. Some believe they're saved by coming forward in an altar call. None of these are effective means of salvation. There is only one saving response, and that is to repent and believe the gospel the first command of our Lord Jesus in Mark 1.15.
Did you know that Jesus also ended his earthly ministry with the command, repentance shall be preached in my name for the forgiveness of sin? Did you know that all the apostles went out and proclaimed that people should repent? Mark 6, 12. Many people believe that repentance is not necessary for salvation. It was important to the Lord Jesus. He is the Savior. The apostles called every man everywhere to repent. So in closing, we must tell Catholics that something finished cannot continue. A cross is not an altar. A debt forgiven is not still owed. A gift cannot be merited or earned. And two antithetical doctrines cannot both be true. That's why we must exhort Roman Catholics, abide in God's word, submit to the authority of God's word. The ultimate choice for you is, are you going to trust Christ in his word or the teachings and traditions of your religion. It is impossible to believe both. As we share with many evangelicals, we ask them, what is keeping you from being a more faithful witness for the Lord Jesus? The most common response is, I don't feel like I know the gospel well enough. Well, I put together what are called gospel cards. I took the 12 most important words of the gospel and I put them on individual cards, always beginning with God, who created man perfectly, but man fell into sin, and now he needs Jesus Christ. And it is only by his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, and by faith and repentance, they can receive the righteousness of God that comes from believing the truth found in the gospel. On the back of each one of these cards are four bullet points defining and explaining what each one of these words means. This is an excellent way for you to go deeper into the gospel. We pass them out at dinner parties at the end of dinner, and we ask people to explain what each word means, and then the rest of the people can join in, and only then can they turn it over and see what the Bible says about each word. You can lay them out in front of whoever you're witnessing to and simply say, if your eternal destiny is based on your knowledge of these words, which one would you like to know more about? What's fascinating as we do this, the most common word that is picked up first is sin. It's almost like everybody knows they're sinners, but they want to find out if there's a loophole. Well, we want to equip and encourage you to be faithful to the Great Commission. Thank you for the opportunity to share this morning. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Our Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is indeed our all-sufficient Savior. And Father, we pray that each one of us here would leave not only with a greater compassion for those who are perishing, but a greater desire to be faithful witnesses for the Lord Jesus. Father, if there be anyone here this morning that is still trusting in what they must do, may you grant them repentance and they will trust in what Christ has done. Father, we thank you for the great privilege to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray we'd be faithful to the calling, make his gospel known throughout the world. And we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.